These are um, driving principles uh, behind uh, development in the road here. Uh, so let's start. Uh, so who am I? I have been doing uh, application development, uh, local, mobile, and uh, web since 2010. Most of the time of the most of the time of this was doing open source, and have, I have been a Rotkey contributor since 2018, uh, handling parts of uh, the front end uh, infrastructure, packaging. So what you do in a startup, pretty much uh, touching all over uh, the code base. Uh, uh, so let's start with the problem today. The problem today is that uh, we don't have enough decentralization. A lot of the software we use daily is uh, closed source. Uh, it runs on data centers. And there, you don't have ownership or control of your data. Uh, they can use it to train uh, machine learning algorithms, uh, use it for whatever uh, reason. There is no transparency, and you have to trust that they use it as they claim. Uh, they might claim that they have encryption, but you don't have any way to verify that there is no master key, uh, and there is no way to be sure that all the claims are true. Uh, then your data can leak. Uh, this can happen with different ways, like, for example, accidents. Uh, and in turn, got too much access, uh, didn't know what they were doing, and all your private information is public. Or hacks. Uh, or uh, some companies just outright sell data. Uh, there was a nice John Oliver episode about data brokers that was really scary on how much information they could get about people, even sensitive information like healthcare and uh, the exact point where people uh, were living. Uh, then other problems are that companies can go out of business and then uh, basically you lose access to all your data. Uh, another problem can be that they can deplatform you. Uh, something happens, your account is locked, and then poof, for your data is gone. Uh, we can see some uh, examples. So, for example, uh, uh, Daper started blocking all the Russian users. So basically, they lost access to their funds. Um, and then we had the case of Snapchat, where employees were abusing uh, data access to just spy on users. And uh, as we saw, like Uber was hacked recently by a teenager. So uh, it's easy to, you know, if your public information goes out then there is no way back. Uh, then we had the ledger hack, like uh, people were receiving mail at their homes, which can be really scary because their public addresses, uh, their private addresses, the home addresses were outside in public. So let's talk about open source. Uh, what is open source? Like there are te uh, 10 criteria that uh, define open source. Uh, the main idea is that the open source software is freely distributed along with the source code and it doesn't limit uh, the usage. Uh, there is no discrimination against people and against, uh, against usages. Everyone can use open source software. Uh, we also have cases of uh, software that has public available code, but it isn't open source. Uh, some examples uh, include you know, the delayed open source lines, uh, license that uh, Uniswap and Aave have and uh, maybe MongoDB server-side public license. And uh, in a lot of the cases, I can understand the reason behind that, because it's really hard for open source projects to fight against big companies. You know, like uh, the reason for the server-side public license is that AWS was taking all of um, MongoDB, selling it as a service, and then the developers didn't have the funds, and they had to maintain and fix the issues. Uh, so why open source? There are some strong benefits building open source. You can have a strong community involvement. You can have transparency, reliability, security. And it also makes attracting uh, talent easier, and uh, it avoids also a vendor lock-in. So like community involvement. Uh, there are people around, like uh, someone needs a feature, we might be overwhelmed, and someone with technical knowledge can come and contribute to the code base and add their feature that they want to use so other people can also use it. Uh, the non-technical people, 
uh, can contribute with translations, uh, making the app available to a bigger amount of people, or uh, documentation, uh, or just open issues. The code is really transparent. Like, you don't have to trust what the developer claims that the software does. You can easily read the code, or other people can read the code, and verify that these claims are actually true. And uh, open source software tends to be more reliable and secure. It's peer-reviewed, so anyone can read the code, and it's easier to spot flaws earlier um, than closed source. Um, we have uh, like, uh, software we always use that is really robust, uh, like exam for example, Firefox, uh, the Linux kernel, uh, Ethereum clients, Nginx, and this is highly reliable uh, software we use everywhere, and it's all open source. Uh, then uh, uh, open source can make uh, attracting talent really easy. Uh, because it's always easier to hire someone that uh, you have previously worked with, you had the good interaction, and then maybe you also take your code and you can see in an easier way that someone is a good fit for the, your culture, uh, which is not always the case uh, when uh, doing some small interviews and uh, you know, like giving some kind of task. And then, uh, like I said, you can avoid vendor lock-in. Uh, you always have access to the source code, you always have access to the application, you can check the data, you can access the data. So uh, in case you want to move and migrate from the platform, uh, it becomes really easy because you can access everything. Uh, so the biggest problem with open source is funding uh, because it's hard to, mon to monetize open source software. Um, we had uh, like some major incidents, for example, there was uh, the Log4j hack uh, or uh, OpenSSL Heartbleed. And we, what we found out out of this is that you had a couple of overwhelmed uh, software developers maintaining infrastructure, critical software, and everyone using it, but they were always underfunded. No one was paying for that. And this uh, led to huge security problems. Uh, so uh, there are different ways to fund, but it's always uh, difficult. Uh, for example, you can accept donations, you can have as we do in Rocky, uh, we can uh, get uh, uh, grants for integrations with other protocols. Uh, Gitcoin grants is something that helps us a lot to build the software. And then we have premium subscriptions, but uh, this doesn't really work because it's hard to monetize retail. And, uh, you know, as a nice small software, it's hard for us to actually have uh, the amount of people uh, that we would need to uh, have a sustainable source of income. Uh, so, uh, let's talk about local-first software. Uh, in local-first software, you control your data. Everything happens on the machine you control. Uh, there are uh, three major principles. So, the network is optional, uh, local data is the primary data, and security and privacy are really fundamental. So by network is optional, we don't mean that you don't have access to the network. Like you can use your Wi-Fi, uh, you can uh, use your local network to access, to access blockchain data, uh, maybe get some uh, your trades from uh, centralized exchanges. What uh, this means is that all the processing of this data happens locally on your machine. Data is not pushed to a remote server, it's not pushed to a remote API, everything happens transparently on your machine. Uh, so, uh, your local data is primary. Unlike, uh, you know, all these clouds, like using Google Drive, the primary source of data is Google Drive. Any copies, if you have, are usually some kind of cast, some secondary copy. And uh, while it's unlikely in, the, in the, um, the case of Google Drive, if your cloud provider goes out of business, then you might lose everything. Uh, then, because everything is stored locally on your machine, it's more secure and it's harder to leak than if you had everything on a data center because you are the owner, you control the machine, and you can actually better protect them. So let's talk about Rotki. That's a nice project we are building. Rotki is a portfolio tracker and accounting tool that is uh, open source, local first, and it's focused on privacy. And Unlike what some people believe, the racket game is not only Lefteris. Like, we know he's kind of super humor, but he cannot do everything on his own. Uh, currently, the Rotkey team consists of seven people, uh, six developers, 
and one person handling operations. Uh, from the developers, uh, we have Lefteris, which most of you, if not everyone, knows. Uh, then I'm uh, doing, uh, he does backend, uh, you know, business development. He does a lot of stuff. Uh, then I'm doing mostly front end, back end infrastructure, like I said. Then we have Jabir that handles also back end. Uh, Luki is working with me on front end, and he has been a really great help. And then we have Isaac and uh, Alexi, which are our newest members, um, that uh, also do back end. And finally, uh, Celina, Lefteri's wife, that really helps us with uh, you know, the non technical stuff that the company needs. And we are really glad to have her. Uh, so um, we are building Rotkey across some uh, like three basic principles. Uh, Rotkey is open source, it's local first, and it uses encryption to store the data. Uh, with this, we can uh, guarantee that uh, the functionality is transparent. Like you don't have to actually trust us. You can verify on how we handle your data and how the app works. Because it's a local app, you own the data. We don't have access to your data. We don't know anything about your data. Uh, any address, any account, any key you put on Rotkey stays locally encrypted in the database in your machine. We don't have access to any of that. And also, you have access to the code. If anything happens to us, hopefully it will not, but if anything happens to us, someone can pick up the software and keep providing value to the users. Um, so let's talk about uh, Rotkey's architecture. Uh, Rotkey is split into parts. One is the Python backend, and the other is the frontend. The frontend is really simple, it just calls the backend, and it's what you see when you open the app. Uh, the backend does all the data processing. It uh, calls uh, open APIs, uh, open nodes, or maybe you can also add your local nodes. So if you run in, uh, your own Ethereum node, uh, Rotkey can hit it, and it will be uh, immensely faster than hitting public nodes. Uh, and then we have uh, two databases. One is the encrypted user DB that uses SQL Cypher to uh, encrypt. And this is where your private data stays. And then we have the global DB that uh, usually has asset information. Uh, the way we package Zerotki uh, is a double way. So we have an Electron app that is available for Mac OS, uh, Linux, and Windows. And we now support also um, Arms, uh, Apple Silicon Max, um, and then we have uh, the Docker image, where you can deploy on a machine you control, and you can access it uh, via web. Although you should be careful there, because Rotkey was uh, foremostly designed as a local app, so it would be better if you have a proxy in the front uh, for security reasons. Uh, and then there is another way to run Rotkey if you own a DAP node. There is a DAP node package, and we are in close collaboration with DAP node, which makes things really easier, uh, and we want to improve uh, the experience there. So for example, we are working to make uh, auto-configuring your uh, local nodes in Rotkey uh, automatic. Uh, so uh, Rotkey does portfolio tracking. Uh, at the moment, we support Ethereum, Kusama, Polkadot, Avalanche, uh, Bitcoin Cash, and Bitcoin, uh, along with a number of centralized exchanges and DeFi protocols. Uh, in the next release, uh, in this, uh, we are doing work so that it uh, makes it easier for us to support multiple EVM chains. So slowly, we will start adding support for multiple EVM chains, starting with Optimism. So uh, in Rocky, you can see your account history. Lefteris had a talk in uh, Tuesday talking about how we do transaction decoding. Uh, here you can see how this looks inside the app. Uh, in this example, you can see me uh, basically migrating 400 sites to die and then selling them for 1.7 ETH on Kyber. Uh, then we have accounting. Uh, accounting in Rotkey is customizable. Uh, we try to be as general as we can so that uh, we can support as many jurisdictions. Uh, you can parameterize how you generate your PNL report, and then you can export the CSV that you can pass to your accountant and do your tax report. Uh, another great feature we have is uh, Ethereum staking. Uh, you can see your uh, staker's performance, you can see your daily stats, uh, and you can see aggregated information about everything. And another part of Rotkey is insights. Um, so we have graphs for statistics, uh, although they are a bit problematic 
because you have to open the app every day so that uh, we don't rely at the moment on uh, chain history because that's quite hard, although we want to do that in the future. But at the moment, we depend on snapshots, so you have to open the app every day uh, so that the app can uh, collect these snapshots. This is important. Like, um, if you value your privacy, please run a full node. Like, it's really important for us. And you know, like, an easy way would be to you know, get your DAP node, uh, have your full node like running GIF or Ergon or Nethermind, and then uh, you can use TrueBlox as an indexer because in Rocket at the moment, we have a problem. Uh, because there is no easy way to get uh, an account's transactions, we have to rely on Etherscan. And this can be problematic from a privacy perspective because Etherscan rates limits you. And you have to put an API key. And if you put an API key, you basically connect all your information, like your email address, um, your IP address, your accounts, and probably they, uh, they, they have a good privacy policy, but you have to trust them for that because they are a closed source software. So the best idea would uh, be to have something like TrueBlox running, uh, and TrueBlox can index the chain and can detect a lot of these uh, transactions, uh, which can then fit uh, to Rotkey. And this way, you could do a really privacy-focused uh, portfolio tracking and accounting. Plus, as a bonus, you can act if you run Rotkey on Dapnot, you can access your portfolio through the VPN locally in your mobile device. So that's, uh, you know, like we met the user using uh, Rotkey in such a way in ETCC, and it was a really happy moment because we don't actually have any documentation on how to do that. So uh, it, it was really nice. Uh, I just went a bit fast. <laughs> uh, <laughs> So yes, uh, so if you want to reach out, um, you can reach out through Discord. And uh, please, please, uh, really, like we built Rotkey for the community. We built it for us and for other people. So it would be nice if you uh, give it a try. Like download the app, uh, run it, test it, give us feedback. We always hear feedback. And uh, the way we build the app is based on the user's feedback. So uh, please do and let us know. Uh, then you can follow the Berotki app account on uh, Twitter. Most of the times, it's Lefteris tweeting from there. Not always. And uh, yeah, you can also buy a premium subscription. It is a bit of support to us. Doesn't help uh, sustain the project, but it still helps, uh, helps us a lot. And with this, you can actually unlock the full Berotki experience because the free, uh, free version has some limitations. Mm, uh, yes, so uh, it was a bit fast. Thank you, Kelsos. Do we have questions in the audience? I'm, I'm liking the, a lot of these small projects, and I'm, I'm liking a lot of them. But I find them. Uh, I have. I. How do you finance Rodkey? That's my question. Uh, the funding. Yeah, the funding. Uh, how, did, how? How is your? Are you in? Are you in freedom to release the business model? Because at the end of the day, you all have to eat. I know you have to eat. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. So funding is really hard. Like I said. Uh, we currently have uh, funding through Gitcoin grants, which is one of the, our biggest source of support. And then uh, Lefteris is trying to find uh, ways so that we can uh, get grants for integrating with different protocols. So these, I think, are the, our main ways of funding and paying salaries. Of course, you know, it's a, as an open source uh, project, we do it uh, out of passion. So our salaries are not the best. Like, uh, we are below market rate. But uh, you know, it's something we love to do. So yeah, it's hard, it's hard. And then we have the premium subscription, but uh, at the moment, our premium subscription is uh, 10 euros per month, which uh, you can imagine how many users you would want to be able to sustain the project out of um, this subscription model. Hi. Um, this might have been covered in the other presentation that Lefteris did. Um, you said you rely on Etherscan for transactions, but you, I assume you've looked at things like the graph, which is like more decentralized. What do you think of that? Uh, yeah, so we use the graph, uh, but uh, in our use case, it's not a perfect fit because you know, like, uh, there is uh, no unified model of the subgraphs. So for every protocol we support, we have to add a new subgraph, and this uh, actually gives us a huge maintenance cost because we have to go and you know, like, 
implement on our side the schema, handle every subgraph in a different way, and uh, then, like, as soon as the subgraph uh, breaks, we have to fix it, like, communicate with people that uh, are maintaining the subgraphs, and then we have to release a patch release to fix that for our users because the app is broken. And uh, this is why we're trying to find a way that is more unified and more generic and that doesn't need the extra maintenance cost. Because, you know, like uh, the way the ecosystem works, new protocols pop up, and we have to support them. Because our users also want the, uh, want the support for these protocols. So it's uh, really hard for us to go and implement each subgraph for its protocol and it becomes a maintenance help for uh, our small team. Thank you again, Kelsos. Thank you.